from uh, NIST, Boulder, Colorado, and he's going to be telling us how to build or how to start to build a quantum computer, in particular quantum state manipulations of trapped ions. So, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Wen Yao and all, all of his uh, colleagues who organized the meeting and for inviting me here. So, uh, so I know I'm, uh, I'm uh, probably one of the few experimentalists here, so rather than trying to impress you with our latest gadgets, I'm going to try to give a kind of an overview of how we might, the, the quantum state manipulation of, of trapped ions and uh, how this might play into making a, a quantum processor. So I think, uh, of course, if you want to find out the latest, you go to your favorite popular magazine. This is, I don't, I don't know whether this is common in Australia, but uh, and it's a popular magazine in the U.S. And this was an article about a year ago uh, from Time Magazine on the D-Wave computer, and it's, it's filled with super superlatives. And in fact, it must have been a great way for them to raise money for the company because it. There's so many extravagant claims uh, about the machine. But anyway, I won't say any more about that except one little thing I, I'll uh, say here is that the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the comments they say, well, n nobody how knows how it actually works. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, I think we, we do know how it works and how it doesn't work. Right. There's really no mysteries here. And I think, I think most of us feel, most of us experimentalists feel that there's no magic. It's just you know, we got to solve a lot of very hard technical problems to make our way forward. But I, th I, I think ultimately we're, we're, we're fairly optimistic. So we, I'm going to, just to summarize, I'll say a little bit about how we make qubits with, uh, with ions. Uh, I'll say, in, in fact, in our work at, at NIST, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, my whole career, one of our main topics has been spectroscopy and atomic clocks. And we, w in the about 20 years now we've been in the business of trying to do these quantum information things and I'll say a little bit how, how those th the, the, the two subjects are actually very close in terms of the experiments. And I'm, mo I'm mostly going to give uh, examples from uh, our, our work but, uh, but uh, I, you know, I just want to stress there's many groups r worldwide wor working on this problem, a lot of nice work. Uh, and just in ions from many groups. That, that, uh, so what I'll talk about is mostly just representative of, of where we're at. So let me say a little bit about one of our qubits. And this one was more interesting for uh, spectroscopy, but it, it gives the basic idea of how, how we can make quantum bits out of, out of atoms. And so one, one, of our, one of the atoms we played with was uh, mercury. And there's, a, there's an optical transition that's actually in the near ultraviolet. Uh, and this transition, the upper state has a fairly long lifetime. So uh, at least on, on some relative scale, these, when we make superpositions, they're preserved for a, a fair amount of time. Uh, and uh, so how do we measure these things? We can make, excuse me, we can make superpositions of, say, the crown in this excited state. And uh, by shining a laser on resonance with transition for a certain amount of time. So how do we measure this? And one of the nice things about the atoms in general is that we can, we can often find cases where uh, there'll be some other transition uh, which has a very short lifetime. And if we drive this transition here, we can scatter a lot of photons and, and detect those photons. So if we start out with a with an atom in this superposition state of these two levels here. Uh, and then if we turn on this, this, this laser on this transition, we'll, e we'll either project the atom to the, the ground state or this excited state. And if it's projected to the ground state, then we'll scatter a lot of photons, which we can detect. Uh, even a small fraction of the ions, we can easily tell uh, that the atom is in the ground state. Conversely, if the atom is projected up onto the upper state when we turn on this laser, then we see no scattering. And in fact, we can easily differentiate the no scattering versus scattering uh, and get essentially 100% detection efficiency. Uh, so I I'm not going to say very much about clocks, but just to say this has been one of our, 
our main lines of interest for a long time. We started, first started working on this mercury ion in 1981, and, uh, and, and basically what we do is we, we probe this transition and, and then do this measurement as I've described. Uh, so we alternate these two, these two lasers, and basically we, we just want to find where the, the condition where the, we make this transition with maximum probability, and then the laser that's used uh, for this transition we know is in synchronism with the oscillations of the atom, and that defines a, a frequency reference or a, a frequency standard. And some of the features that we, that we take advantage of in these kind of experiments is that the fact that we're trapping the ions, that, that means on average they're not going anywhere, so the first order Doppler shift goes to zero. We also use the technique of laser cooling, and that suppresses the time dilation shifts, which are important at the levels of accuracy we're getting to. And in this experiment, one of the features is we, we also went to 4 Kelvin uh, and, the, and the main reason for that is we've had some chemical reactions with, which would get rid of the ions, and by going to 4 Kelvin, we essentially get extremely high vacuum and we, uh, we don't lose the ions. So that was one of the main reasons we, we did that. Anyway, yeah, we've, been, we've been working on this since 1981, and uh, of course this, the, the standard of definition for the second, the cesium atom, had, had always been getting better, better during that time, so we're chasing a moving target, but, but finally in uh, the mid-2000s, we finally reached a level of uncertainty in, the, in this transition where, we, where it was clearly better than the, the, uncertain, the systematic uncertainty in, in cesium. And these days now in all the standards labs, the, uh, everybody's converting to optical transitions. And I, I won't be able to tell you all the reasons why, but this is, this is where the future is for, for these high precision High accuracy references. Oh, I should have, and I should have said that the person who led the work in our group is Jim Berkowitz. The, and there's uh, there's many, as I said, there's many other groups pursuing these these ideas. These are just the case for, uh, of atomic ions. There's also many experiments with neutral atoms. And if you did want to find out more, a little bit more about that, it's a, there's a review paper here. One of the interesting uh, ions is this this uh, thorium, which uh, uh, it actually it looks like there's a, a nuclear transition that might be in the visible. It turns out it looks like it's fairly far in the ultraviolet, but uh, it may be interesting to make a, a reference based on this nuclear transition. Uh, so let me come back to the to some other features, and we'll th this we, we these are this leads into how we might do quantum information with atomic ions. So on a, on, a, on a finer scale, what we can think of if we have a single mercury ion in this, in this trap, which I haven't said anything about, uh, we, we apply a combination of, of oscillating and static electric fields to hold the ion, and you don't need to know the details, but to a very good approximation, these, these traps make a three-dimensional harmonic well. Uh, and in fact, the, so to a high degree, the motion of the ion, as I say, in three directions, and just looking at one direction, it, it, the, the quantum levels of motion are an equally spaced ladder because it's a, to a high degree a, a harmonic oscillator. And of course, the, the one difference is that uh, at the transition frequencies for these optical transitions is on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz, and for these, for these motion transitions, we're typically in a, in the range of oscillation frequencies of around uh, uh, one to 10 megahertz. So it's about an eight or nine order of magnitude difference in, in frequency scales here. Uh, nevertheless, one of the things that it's interesting to think about is, is, is how we might freeze out the motion and manipulate the quantum levels of motion. So when we do the spectroscopy, as I mentioned, we, we, we tend to alternate this probing laser and then the detection laser. Uh, and then the kind of experiment we do, if we sweep the frequency of this probe laser, we get a spectrum that looks like this. Now, one of the details I'm leading, leaving out here is we do what's called Doppler cooling, which cools the motion down to an equivalent temperature of about a millikelvin. And so what you see here, this overall profile is, is the Doppler broadening uh, to, to due to this millikelvin temperature. And you see these, the, these several features here. The central one is the one, is the one we want. That's the, the, the frequency or the, 
frequency that defines the, the transmission frequency of the, of the clock. And these other, these other features are, you can think of it classically if the ion is oscillating back and forth, there are frequency modulation sidebands that, that are imposed. You can, if you're riding along with the, la uh, with the atom, you see the, the atom being, uh, the laser being frequency modulated. And so, so what this spectrum represents, you see this is the probability that the atom remains in the ground state after we probe it. And when it goes down, that means we've made this transition here. And some of the features then in the, in the quantum description is this central feature is the case where we drive this optical transition, but the, the motion energy level doesn't change. And there's some interesting physics about this. This is very much like the Mossbauer effect, uh, where the, the atom doesn't recoil. The, the momentum of the photon actually goes into the, the whole apparatus, the trap. And so there's, there's no shift due to the momentum being absorbed by the atom. Anyway, uh, and then if we look at these, these so-called sideband features, what this, what this lower one represents the case is where we drive the transition and the atom, uh, the motion energy level is reduced by one quantum. On the other hand, this, other, this upper sideband is the case where when we drive the transition, the, the motion quantum number is increased by one. Uh, so one of the one of the features that will be important, uh, uh, particularly in, the, in this context of quantum information processing, is we'd like to put the atom in the in the ground state of motion. And for the conditions we can realize in these experiments, the uh, it, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, what we do is that we we drive the atom on this 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 sideband where the where the motion energy level decreases by one. And we can arrange, arrange conditions, the so-called Lambdicky uh, criterion, where when the atom decays from this upper state, oops, let me go back here. Uh, when, it, when it decays from this upper state, it does so without changing the, 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 the motion energy state. And basically, since these, all these levels are equally spaced, then all we need to do is leave the, the laser <coughs> tuned onto this feature here and the atom uh, after it walks down one level here on the next stage, it does the same thing and, it'll, and it keeps walking down this level of quantum states. And finally, when it reaches the ground state, then this, this scattering stops and we can, we can tell that when that condition happens. So this is the way we produce the atoms in the motional ground, in the ground state. So, okay, so this, this is all, all a prelude to how we might use this, this, these ions to make a a quantum uh, a processor. And the basic idea came from uh, two well-known theorists in atomic physics, uh, Ignacio Serac and Peter Zoller. And uh, so as a side note, uh, actually uh, there, the ICAP, the International Conference on Atomic Physics was held in Boulder in 1994. And we kind of as, a, uh, as an enrichment talk, we invited uh, Arthur Eckert to come and teach us a little bit about about uh, the ideas of quantum computing, and this was this is basically just a very uh, short time after uh, Peter Shore came out with his factoring algorithm. And uh, anyway, uh, Peter Zoller and Ignacio Srek, uh, they were very familiar with the kind of experiments uh, that, that we could do, and they 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 basically I think had the first uh, comprehensive idea for how you might actually make a, a quantum computer, a quantum information processor. Anyway, the, the form they cast it in was for the, the case of atomic ions. And so what you want to think about is this, this is also another form of trap. I won't say that it works on the same principles. It, we apply a combination of oscillating and static electric fields to this. But it, again, it, this electrode structure forms a three-dimensional harmonic well. In this case, when we put the ions in, we make the well along this direction fairly weak compared to the transverse direction. So the, the well looks something like that. And all the atoms want to fall to the bottom of the well, but the Coulomb interaction between them holds them apart into this, into this linear array. So their idea was the following. If we, can, if we can apply this same idea of what we call sideband cooling and put all the, all the modes of motion in the ground state, uh, that's sort of a fiducial point where we, where, where we start to, uh, to be able to do the manipulations. And I've only 
shown the case for five ions here. We can actually put quite a few in there. Uh, I'll say how we extend to much larger numbers in, in a little bit here. But anyway, the, in the ideal situation, we can apply this sideband cooling to each one of the modes. There's for five ions, there's 15, three times the number of modes. And they tend to all, the, the motional modes tend to all be at different frequencies, so we can spectrally isolate the, the mode that we want. Anyway, the, the, excuse me, the prescription they gave, and uh, just in general terms, I'll give you a couple of the details in a minute here. The prescription they gave is that uh, it, we start the, we do this laser cooling, we put all the modes ideally in the ground state, at least the mode, particularly the mode we want to uh, uh, operate on here in a second, I'll say. And then what we do is we can, we can just, uh, uh, again, I'll explain how this works in a second, but we, if we apply a laser to, say, that ion, it turns out we can map its superposition state onto a superposition state of the, of the motion. And then what we do, the, 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 key, the key feature of this, of this is that because the, this, you can think of this as kind of like a pseudomolecule, and it has these, these vibrational modes. The key feature is that the motion is shared amongst all the ions. And so the simplest one to think about in the case of five ions is that think about the oscillation and the external well. They all share this motion. And so they, they, when, the, when the state of this first ion is mapped onto a motion state, all these ions feel it. So, and then if we can somehow make a, a, motion, uh, a, a, a quantum gate, a two-bit two gate, between this motion qubit and the internal state of this ion, then basically we've made a gate between the, the two selected ions. And then the, the complete it, the final thing as we do is we unmap the, the quantum state and put it back into this ion. And just to give you some idea of how, how this works, again, I'll, I'll use the example of the optical transitions in, in mercury. Uh, so again, we, we first freeze the, out the motion. So for, uh, so there, the, the, the first ion that we select, it'll be in some superposition of its internal states, but the motion will be in the, in the ground state. And then what, to do this mapping, what we do is we simply take this amplitude here and with the laser tuned to, the, to this lower sideband, we can map this, put this amplitude down here and that, that does, completes this, this mapping process. And basically, you'll notice that, the, in fact, the laser, you might say, well, that might affect this level, but there's no level up here for it to go to. That's why we get this kind of selective dynamics, which al allows us to do this mapping. So then the, the way the spin motion gate works on this, on this second ion is that we, uh, we're going to use another auxiliary state in the electronic ground state of the mercury ion. And basically, all we, all we do to, to get a, well, you can talk about a phase gate here, or a, uh, is that basically we, we take and map this amplitude down into this auxiliary state and then let it go uh, evolve back up into the other st upper state. And uh, just as if when a spin one half particle is rotated by two pi, that, that component of the wave function picks up a minus sign. And this then makes a non-trivial logic gate that we can, that we can from this and doing spin rotations, we can make controlled knots and things like that. But this is the basic form of the gate. And we, we just happened to be, we were in a lucky position because we were trying to do some, some simple experiments trying to entangle the ions. And when, they, when uh, Peter Zoller and Ignacio Serac came on this proposal, we were able to jump on this and, and a couple months after they publish their paper, we were able to do this, demonstrate this logic gate. And uh, I should have said, uh, Chris Monroe was in our group at that time. He, he was leading this project. Uh, so just to, just to give a general idea, I mean, I, I, I described this basic process, and, I, and, and, and then this proposal has stimulated a lot of work. So this is, this is just the groups that I know about that are working on atomic ions to exercise and develop some of these ideas of how we may, might do quantum processing. Uh, and I think it, one thing to say, I'll, I'll give you, there's some a bit more advantageous gates, I'll describe one in a minute, that uh, uh, have, have evolved from all these groups working on this. 
I think that, uh, 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 but w one thing that uh, certainly emphasizes that the, the key idea is that how we get the ions to talk to each other is through the, through the quantum states of, of motion. And so it's uh, this basic idea from Serac and Zoller is the one we all use. And of course, I'm only going to talk about atomic ions. And as you know, there's many other possible uh, platforms where, where people are, are studying the possibilities in, in those uh, realms. OK, just to give you a rough idea how, how, how we're generally thinking about scaling up is that uh, one thing I described, I showed a cartoon of this three-dimensional trapping structure. One thing we can do is take advantage of, of lithographic techniques. And in this, in this experiment here, the, each of these electrodes, uh, what, what, they all lie in a plane. And it makes the what nice thing about that is we can easily make a one-zone trap as we can make a multi-zone trap. And in fact, each one of these little squares in, in this, in the around this loop here, we call this a racetrack for obvious reasons. But each one of these little squares is a zone where we can, we can uh, confine a, a few or multiple, uh, a single or multiple ions. And so the basic scheme that, that many of us are pursuing is to, to, to scale up. It's easier to handle a relatively small number of ions in any one trapping zone. So the idea is to, to, to if we, whoops, if we want to, if we want to do gates between uh, any particular ions, we, we, we'll, we'll position them in, in one of the trap zones and then do the logic gates uh, between those selected ions. And so we just basically move ions around in this, in this arrangement to, to bring the ones we want together to perform the gates. Uh, so one other thing that uh, uh, other people are, in fact, Chris Monroe, who's now at the University of Maryland, uh, we can do, we can, uh, He's, he's demonstrated a way to do remote entanglement. That is, if we have ions in different locations. Uh, I won't have time to go through the details here, but basically uh, uh, he, he's demonstrated this with ytterbium ions. And basically, uh, you can arrange a condition where you entangle the internal states of the ion with, a, with say, the polarization states of a photon. And then if you if you grab those photons and then interfere them on a beam splitter and look for certain detection signals, then you'll basically what happens you're you're able to in entangle the internal states of the ions. So this is some other strategy of how you might entangle ions in in these in these separate uh, arrays. Uh, so let me just say I'll give one more example now a little bit more advanced. The uh, way we do the gates, or uh, rather, uh, 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 turns out to be experimentally more advantageous. And the the idea, the ideas that we use here, is that uh, so think of a think of the that we have a standing wave uh, uh, laser beam, and the and the and the waves are interfering. So there's there's uh, there's uh, nodes and anti nodes, and basically what we do is we tune the lasers. Uh, uh, we detune them from the transitions of the qubit transitions. And because we detune them, there's, there's optical stark shifts on the atoms. And because they're detuned uh, and they're, they're in these intensity gradients, then the, we can make state-dependent forces on the ions, which push them one way or other, up and down in this picture here. So just uh, sort of in a cartoon view, the way this, this works is that uh, so let's suppose that we have uh, uh, both ions in the, in the zero state, and uh, the, the dipole forces are, s are such that they get pushed down. If the ions are in the, in the upper state, they go get pushed up. And if they're in opposite state, then they get pushed opposite directions. Now, one of the, what, one of the things that happens in this is that the, you can see the Coulomb interaction is different for this case where the ions are in opposite states. And this can give rise to a differential energy shift between the, the, the states of opposite uh, in, uh, spin, we say, or internal states versus the one that are in the same state. And so what we can do is we can, by exercising these dipole forces, we can, and applying for a certain time, we can put a relative phase shift on these states versus the states where the internal, uh, and, ver and the ions when they're in the same state. And in fact, we can adjust those to be, say, a, a pi over two phase shift and realize this, this form of a phase gate here. 
Now, in fact, we can, we can ease the problem a little bit. I, I sort of explain this in terms of a, of a static uh, dipole force. And, uh, but what you can think of is that uh, if we let, if we, if we let this, oops, if we let this, this, uh, this wave run over, if we do to detune the upward wave relative to, the, to the, the wave that's coming down slightly, basically we get this, the standing wave washes over the ions, and what we do is we, we have it go a, at a frequency where the peaks and valleys are going uh, at a f at a at a rate that's near the motion one of the motion, the motional mode frequencies. And this is just a simpler way to 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 uh, invoke this separation without having to have extremely high powers and do it with static fields. Uh, anyway, so this is the this is the kind of gates that most of us are using now. And uh, uh, I think one of the one of the highlights is recently the the group at Oxford, led by David Lucas. They've they've gotten a, a two qubit phase gate with an error of about ten to minus three, and I think that's probably the world's record. Uh, there's many that are approaching that, but I think that's probably sets the state of the art for the errors on two qubit gates now. The other thing that's interesting and in, uh, about this is that basically this 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 phase gate basically it's it's invoking a uh, you know this this kind of operator here kind of a spin-spin interaction, and independent of where you think quantum computing is going, I think a lot of us are, are really interested in the idea of, of simulating, and uh, just to give you one idea of how this works. So this is this is uh, experiments that, that I think the most interesting work is going on in the in the groups of uh, Chris Monroe and Reiner Blot. Uh, but anyway, so what, what you want to think about here, we've got this washboard potential that's sweeping down over the ions near one of the motional uh, mode frequencies. Uh, and that will, that will generate this spin-spin interaction. And so I, I, I won't be able to give you all the reasons how, how this works, but it turns out that if we make this, this uh, motional uh, if we tune the, this washboard potential so that it's applying forces very near this center of mass mode, that is where all the ions are oscillating up and down, basically we can get a kind of a global spin-spin uh, interaction. And then also if we detune it slightly farther, uh, depending on how much we detune it, we can get, we can, uh, this is essentially an infinite range interaction, spin-spin interaction, but by detuning it, we can vary the range here uh, so that uh, uh, in the extreme case, it's dominated by nearest neighbor interac interactions or uh, in the other extreme, it's a global interaction. And so anyway, the, the long and short of it is that by adding also a transverse magnetic field, we can uh, realize this transverse icing model. And this is, a, this is being pursued by a lot of groups, not just with, uh, with atomic ions, but this is sort of a test case for how we might hopefully do useful simulations in the future. Uh, and uh, as I say, the, the groups are leading this effort, uh, uh, Chris Monroe's group and, and Reiner Blot and his colleague Christian Roos in Innsbruck. And uh, one of the interesting experiments they've been, they've been able to do it uh, uh, recently is they can create an entanglement in part of this string of ions and they can see how it, how it evolves, how it, the dynamics of this entanglement across the the string and, the, and and there's a lot of inter other interesting things they're thinking about. In our group, we're we're, we're a bit behind in terms of the capabilities. Uh, on the other hand, that uh, uh, John Bollinger in, in our group leads an effort where uh, basically this is a different kind of trap. But you can think of that. You know, basically, what we have is a pancake of ions, and then you can see there's a, they form a a, a, triangu a triangular lattice. And the modes we want to excite, this is the similar mode spectrum to what I showed in the previous field grab. This is for the motion of the ions out of the plane of the picture there. But we can think about the, the same kind of experiment. So uh, John and his, his colleagues have, have, have also shown how, this, how, how you can generate this, this either short or long range spin-spin interaction over the, over the array of ions. And the, and the one, in, you know, one thing we're hoping to to play on is that the, this two-dimensional structure would, would then potentially give a richer structure for these icing-type interactions. And there's a new apparatus now that 
to increase the interaction strength, which was for various technical reasons they, they couldn't make very strong in the previous experiments. Another thing we're pursuing uh, in our group uh, experiment led by Andrew Wilson and Dee Dee Leipert is actually, uh, rather than being this in this, this apparatus that I just showed you, these are sort of a kind of a self-assembled triangular lattice. It's the, again the balance, it, it, it forms from the balance of the trapping forces uh, and, the, and, the, and the outward force from the Coulomb interaction. But we might also be able to make different geometries by actually positioning uh, individual ions over individual trapping sites. And uh, so and this, we've got a long way to go on this, but we, we have been able to do sorry, kind of the first baby steps. We can make a, two, two, a double well potential. The ions here are separated about, about 30 microns, and then we can get this, this coupling that defines the spin-spin interaction. And we're hoping to, to build, up, build up on that to make these, these kind of arrays. Uh, so I should say one, one of the things that this, this interaction is, it's fairly small, it's less than a kilohertz in these experiments where uh, the ions are separated by about 30 microns. And of course what we'd like to do is scale the system down even, even smaller. The reason for that is these interactions scale as one over the dimensions to the third power. And so we want to make the trap smaller. It turns out we can make the trap smaller, but all of us in the ion business are, are plagued by uh, what we call anomalous heating because we don't know what the source is. But as we make the, the trap structures smaller, we see in a heating effect, which it, it's a little hard to characterize uniformly, but the preponderance of evidence is that the heating goes up as one over the dimensions to the fourth power. So we're really hurt by this heating. And any heating during any of these experiments, if the particularly I think it, of, the, of the logic gates. If, if there's a single quantum of motion absorbed during uh, a logic gate, then uh, that kills, basically kills the gate. So we're stuck with this, with this general problem. All of us are, particularly at, when we've gone to smaller dimensions. So uh, one of the things we, we're trying to learn from uh, surface science people, and uh, we have some collaborators at NIST, and so we did one of the first things they always do when they do surface science experiments is that they, use an argon ion beam to basically just scrub the surface and, uh, and that, uh, that gets rid of imp uh, 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 surface impurities. And in fact, just some crude experiments we've done so far and there's also been other experiments done at Berkeley uh, that show similar gains. So we can reduce the heating by about a factor of 100 and we, we're still well above the electronic, thermal electronic noise heating and we hope to go farther with this. So we're, we're trying to get serious now to really just try to figure out what, what's giving this heating and hopefully we, we can reduce the heating even more and therefore go to smaller dimensions. It turns out that it also helps to go to low temperatures and most of the, most of the work is done by uh, Ike Chong and, and his group at, uh, at uh, MIT. Uh, and it, and it, you know again, the re results are a little bit mixed because it's clear the experiments are affected by surface impurities, but nevertheless, cold temperature does help. Uh, and so, uh, in a, in a, oh, and, well, anyway, so that's why we're, we're trying to work on this and reduce the, the heating to get down to smaller and smaller dimensions to increase these, these interactions. So just uh, b to bore you with a few details, one of the, one of the stupid problems we have, the, the main errors in, in almost all the logic gates in our experiment are due to very mundane things, and it has to do with laser intensity fluctuations at the site of the ions. And so one of the things we've, we've, we've missed for many years is that uh, at, at optical and infrared wavelengths, you can transmit uh, laser beams through fibers, and they have the advantage that you can, pos two, two main advantages, you can, you can put the fibers right up next to where you inject the beams into the trap, and that prevents, or at least reduces significantly mechanical and vibrations to, and then fluctuations of the beam to the air currents. And uh, the other thing is that they significantly improve the beam shape. I won't go walk you through all the details here, but recently we found a, a prescription where we can make ultraviolet, uh, or fibers that will transmit ultraviolet. The problem historically for many decades has been if you stick a ultraviolet beam through a, through a, through a wave, through a fiber, it, it forms color centers and, and, the, and, and the, the beam becomes absorbed and the time scales are 
we're typically on the order of an hour, but now we can get up to, to at least uh, on the order of a thousand hours without damage. So that's one of the things we're working on. And anyway, just to give you an idea, because of these improvements in the beam shape, we've we've gotten up to fidelities uh, this, and our best before this using in these ultraviolet beams was about 0.97 fidelities on our two qubit gates. So we're hoping to go farther than that. Anyway, so the other the other thing, just to give you an idea, one of the other things we're trying to work on. Well, maybe we can get rid of the lasers, and uh, we'll probably always think about. You doing the detection with a laser, as I described earlier with the mercury ion, and we can do some cooling, and so-called so Doppler cooling. But the nice thing we uh, in the in this ideal, uh, I'll just try to give you a brief idea, is that, is that maybe we can we can do these gates by rather than using optical dipole forces, maybe we can use magnetic forces. And so, the basic idea here here is a particular form of this this surface electrode geometry. So one of the things uh, we can do is we can run, if the ions sit right above this electrode here, we can run currents through this, this electrode below them. And we can, with magnetic fields, we can do the, the spin, the, the spin uh, rotations. Uh, also, what we hope to, to, to take advantage of here is that uh, typically uh, we can arrange our qubit states so that they have different magnetic moments. and so. Uh, what we can do is we can create a, uh, ideally a, a magnetic gradient. And what we do here is the, uh, the ideal case is we want to we want to make the if we run currents, oscillating currents through these electrodes, we want to to at the side of the ions we may want to make the magnetic field zero, but we want to maximize the the B field gradient, which then applies forces. And because the the atoms have different magnetic moments in general, then we get this differential force and we can invoke these gates that I uh, indicated with the traveling ways uh, using laser beams. And the, uh, so far, our first experiments uh, done a couple of years ago were uh, certainly not very impressive fidelities on the, on the gates we would make. But we think, anyway, we're, we're hoping to, to push along with this. And, the one ni the nice advantage of this, or some of the nice advantages, is we 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 get rid of uh, we don't have any spontaneous emission. We can use qubit states in the electronic ground states, typically hyperfine states, to to invoke these transitions. So we get rid of spontaneous emission, which also uh, gives gate errors. Uh, we don't have to do very good cooling anymore. We can just Doppler cooling is 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 plenty good enough. We don't have to do this ground state cooling. And it turns out the problem with this, with the ground state cooling, is that require for various technical reasons the power required versus the detection and Doppler cooling lasers that we can do in, in these kind of experiments is about a thousand times larger. So we get we can actually do all these experiments with fairly low power. Anyway, I, I won't uh, bore you with all the details, but we 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 are going after this and trying to do a better job. A couple of things we're going to take advantage of in these. Newer experiments. These experiments are done at room temperature. Uh, we can hopefully get a gain from this this argon beam cleaning that I briefly described. The main limitation in this fidelity here was just due to the, the heating. So we can hopefully knock the heating down and w maybe gain a little bit more by at least cooling to liquid nitrogen temperature. So let me just come back to, to the clocks. Uh, uh, you know, we're a long way maybe from doing any interesting simulations or, or computing, but uh, we can use some simple ideas. And so one of the things we, one of the things we developed coming back to, our, uh, to the atomic clocks, uh, uh, for a long time we've had our idea on, on an aluminum ion. And uh, this is also in the ultraviolet, this transition here, much like mercury, but it has a much longer lifetime. So we could get even higher resolution on when we drive the transition and higher precision on a clock. Now, in fact, we could we could in principle we could detect it the same way we did with mercury. Unfortunately, this is at a prohibitively, prohibitively short wavelength, so we're not able to do this. So what we've done is using the simple ideas of the going back to the Serac and Zoller scheme is that we can, uh, in general, after uh, the after we drive the, we, we'll start the atom in the ground state. We drive this transition, and it'll be in some superposition state. And it turned out we can we can uh, use this idea of mapping that was uh, the the first part of the Serac and Zoller scheme. We can 
map this superposition into a motion superposition of one of the modes of, of two ions, in this case aluminum and mercury, and then we can map that superposition into the, uh, in this case, magnesium ion, and it turns out that's at a wavelength that we can easily detect these transitions. So if we do this indirect detection, then we can, uh, we, we can uh, actually measure the, uh, the transitions in this aluminum ion. So I won't, uh, go through all the details. Anyway, we're da now down to, in these experiments, uh, uh, starting in uh, a few years ago now, we're able to get down to about eight parts in 10 to the 18, and it was limited by the residual motion. Uh, but we've got our work cut out for us. We held the record for a while there, but in this last year, there's been some uh, different uh, experiments, uh, two on, on neutral atoms, another one, an uh, ion experiment uh, using uh, different transitions, and now the, the, the errors they report are, uh, are, are lower than what we've been able to get. And in fact, it's a moving target. So this is Jen Yu's group at, at JILA. They're down to about two parts in 10 to the 18th. So we got our work cut out for us to try to stay in the game. Okay, so let me come back to this. Well, as, as I said, I think we, we, we actually do, we, we know how it works, and in particular, I think I think all the platforms, and we, we basically know the reasons where the errors come from. And so I'd say, uh, I think that's what, even, even though it's, th this is gonna be hard, no, no doubt, I think, we, uh, I think we know what to do. And so I'm, I'm actually fairly optimistic in, uh, about the future. Now, in fact, uh, probably the hardest one is the factoring, which at least to do cryptographically interesting factoring, the problem is so hard that I, I would, I would say, I, I mean, I take, take, you can form your own guess of how long it's gonna take, but it's probably at least decades away. Um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think all of us are, are excited about this idea of quantum simulation. One, one of the interesting kind of plateaus you might say to reach is, uh, uh, we're already, as a group, we're at a point playing with on the order of 20 to 30 ions, and at this point, uh, when we do these simulations, we can no longer simulate on a classical computer with the answer we should get. So that's one breakpoint. I think the really interesting breakpoint, of course, is going to be uh, if we can do a simulation that's going to tell us something new about physics, and that'll that'll really put a, put things on the map. So uh, with that, I'm going to conclude. But I, of course, I want to acknowledge all the people doing the uh, all the people in our group doing the work, and, and this is. This is, they, uh, this is them here, and I won't, can't give them all a sufficient credit. And as I say, this is, I showed on an earlier view graph, there's about on the order of 30 groups around the world now. We're just pursuing these ideas with, with atomic ions. And uh, uh, so anyway, we're, we have our fingers crossed, and uh, hopefully, maybe it won't happen in my lifetime, but hopefully we'll do something interesting in a not too distant future. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, we have time for a few um, questions. Um, okay, so maybe I can I can just uh, oh, oh, okay okay go ahead. Um, uh, we we had a uh, a lecture on uh, Sunday uh, about Josephson junction qubits, and it uh, by Alexandre Blay, and it, toward the end he told us a little bit about where things stand in terms of quantum error correction, because that seems to be a nice playing field for 10 qubits or so. Can you s tell us a little bit about the status uh, of quantum error correction with ions? Well, I think uh, just just in general, I think, uh, I mean, I, I mean, the ion community have, has done some simple implementations of error correction. And I think, I mean, those experiments will certainly come. and. I think uh, one way to answer this question, I think that'll be an interesting playing field for not just superconducting ghost junctions, but, but also ions. But I think we, um, in our group, we've been focusing just trying to, to improve the fidelity of the gates and, and, st and, and institute some of these ideas for, for scaling up. But certainly it'll, ha it'll happen for us too. Right? So I, I, think, uh, I think we can look look for us as a group in the future too. Okay. Oh. 
Ah, 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 sorry, there's me. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned near the end uh, about the uh, quantum logic as a way to improve clocks. And I wonder what your thoughts are on um, using error avoidance or quantum error correction to potentially improve metrology. Well, yeah, one, one of the things that, that we're, uh, you know, thinking of, I mentioned that the, there's a problem with uh, uh, the main problem in, in, in our ion clock has been just due to residual motion. And you mentioned error avoidance. We can, we're trying to, we, we're thinking along the lines of, of being able to detect when the ion heats, for example, while its transition is being probed. So we could, uh, that way we could, uh, you know, that would be one way, one example of how we can use, in that case, error detection. We could throw out that measurement for example, and then, uh, you know, proceed with, you only use the data from uh, experiments where we don't see an, an excitation to help suppress this effect. So there's, there's things like that that we are trying, trying to think about now. Yeah. Okay, uh, Robin. So in your experiment, uh, when you quote these error numbers, that whether they're 2% or half a percent, could you comment on sort of divvying that up into uh, stochastic decoherence versus slowly fluctuating control fields, just because those are sort of in terms yeah. of dealing with them in different modes. That's oh, a good question. And, and I mean, of course, each experiment we have to go through a long list of things. And I think you, you know, in general, I would answer it's all of the above. You know, we have to pay attention to, the, you know, the fluctuating control fields and the, for example, the the heating due to due to, to noisy electric fields. And so uh, I, each experiment's different on, on how much it'll, you know, it, it, the gates are affected, uh, uh, you know, by these various things. But I mean, it's a good question. And as I say, we have a long list of things we go through. And some of the biggest culprits are this residual heating that we see. And we're still stuck with the, the laser, the, the, the control problems. I mentioned the use of fibers that help us maybe make a step in the right direction on that, but we have a long way to go for sure. Okay, uh, is there any last question? Um, if not, I think we should, uh, let's uh, thank Dave again and... Uh,